Ben and Jay's house, so hopefully you can come. This is getting bigger and bigger and better and better. So if you can make it, it would be fantastic. That's next week right after church. So good morning. I am, I suppose, Pastor Dave. I'm Dave Off, one of the pastors here at Gospel Grace. We're glad you can join us online. Thank you. Um, this is our Sunday service. Pastor Kelly asked me to take it so he can, I guess, be in Alabama. Anytime he's not here, he's in Alabama. I don't know why, but anyway. So you might ask me, you say, uh, Pastor Dave, why y'all dressed up today? Thanks, Shane. So I got all dressed up today. I'm celebrating my last day as a 30-year-old. I know you really just came today to celebrate my birthday with me. I'm celebrating all weekend long, so it's been fun. Amen. Amen. You don't have to sing to me. You don't have to sing. It's all right. It's all right. But, you know, I think about it. Um, That's right. Me too. But you think about, you get dressed up, and you, you actually feel good, you know? And I think, you know, you guys, I could help you out a little with this. Why don't you all get dressed up, and get your lady friend dressed up, and go out somewhere. <laughs> think about it. Get dressed up. Put your nicest clothes on, and go out to McDonald's or something. See if you don't have a good time. Seriously, you could go anywhere. You could literally go walk on the boardwalk, whatever, it doesn't matter. When you're dressed up, you feel good, right? You feel good, right? I also got dressed up. This is the suit that I bought for, I think it was my dad's funeral, something like that. I want to look nice, you know? One of the black suit, look nice. And I know we talked about this before, but every time we get together, everybody say, oh, man, we got to get together in better circumstances. Here we are, and then better circumstances. I'm celebrating a birthday tomorrow, 40 years. Hallelujah, so I'm better circumstances. I said, why not get dressed up for better circumstances too? So, so far this year, we started throwing parties. My wife and I, we started doing parties all over the place, had people to our house. We threw a party out in Mechanicsburg at somebody else's house, <laughs> gave them like two days notice, they were coming, and we're having a party at your house. We're going to invite people over. <laughs> but you know what? Every time we do it, we have a nice time. People enjoy being around people. I was down in Florida, and I went out to a couple of parties there with, with people, people I'd never met before, very interesting people. I and mean, we were at one party. It's orchid people and artistic people. And there's a little crossover there, but... In my life, I don't come in contact with a lot of artistic people, so it's way out of people that I'm normally used to talking to. I don't know what to talk about when we talk about art. I love art. I can look at it and say, I, I can get the emotion behind this sculpture, this painting. I can see what created through the emotion that's on there. But I don't know anything about an artist. I couldn't sit there and have a conversation. There's a lady there who was a film director. Now, she talked to Blue Streak, so there was no problem talking to her. She just kept going and going. But... You know, it's very interesting when you talk to these people that are from different circumstances. And uh, I have a friend down there who's in his 80s, and his view of electronics is he has a phone that he can turn on, and he can dial the number, and he knows how to use his TV remote. That's as far as his electronics go. No cell phone, no computer, none of that stuff. That, that's all he, he's got. So when he said down there, he says, uh, because he loves me. I want, to, I, want to see, I want to see you preach a, a sermon. Like, could you give me your notes? I said, you wouldn't understand my notes. My notes is like, talk about this. And then that might be 15 minutes, you know, of what we're doing today. And you don't get that if you just see my notes. So I was like, my notes are no good. So while we were down there, we actually hooked up our Facebook Live. Hallelujah. Right? And we had it streaming through our phone. So it's all grainy and stuff and all, but it worked. And it might sound you know, sort of weird, but I like to watch myself. So after I do this, I'll go home a lot of times and watch it on Facebook. And it's not a prideful situation, people. Don't get the wrong impression, okay? Don't, don't get the wrong impression. I want to see if what, what God revealed to me to talk about, see if it comes across when I listen to it. I'm almost like not grading myself, but I want to see, did, did I really get the point across that I was trying to get across? So I enjoyed watching it with him, but through this thing, and this guy comes from some different background, different circumstances. 
And I could see that as he's watching it, some of the things I was talking about for a group of people that have been in church for a long time and have especially been immersed in a, a grace message, you get what I'm talking about because you know where I'm coming from. But people in other circumstances, they don't always get it. So when Pastor Kelly asked me to preach, I wanted to say, this one's going to be called Simple Gospel. And I think I've already done that three or four times. <laughs> so um, I was sitting there, this is, this is easy, this is what we're going to do, Simple Gospel. Because a lot of times as I was talking in that service that I preached that we watched on, on the Internet, was I was talking about the law. And when I said law to some grace-filled people, we say, yep, that's the old man. That's the schoolmaster, right? That's the old man. We put off the old man. All, all these things, we know who the law is. But for somebody that doesn't understand that, who, who, what the law is and what the law was there for, you have no idea the depth of what's going on and what we're talking about. So... I was thinking, I really wanted to kind of break this down to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But really what it falls down to is when you read the scriptures, I know that gospel grace, one of the things that we say when we read the scriptures, we say, we want you to see Jesus in every scripture. Amen? And that's good. But even beyond that, I want you to see the grace of Jesus Christ and his finished work in every scripture. Now, when, when gospel grace says we want you to see Jesus, that's what we mean. <laughs> you know, but sometimes people read it and say, yeah, I can see Jesus. But I want you to see Jesus as he already did everything. And all you do have to do is just take him and say, I accept your sacrifice, Lord. I accept your righteousness in my life. And that's where it's at, that you are as righteous as Jesus Christ just simply by accepting the sacrifice that he gave to you. It's a free gift, and he, all he wants you to do is just accept it. So there's a simplistic thing there, and you say, wow, I can get that. I, I got that. But I really wanted to break it down. So, and I thought, like, what, what is the law? And when I say to you the law, you know, of course, with gospel grace, I already explained that. But the law could be broken down like this. It's a system of living through a series of commands laid out to produce righteous living. That was revelation from just this morning. So I know it might be a little early to throw that out there because I know some people are just waking up still. But the law would be a system of living. Okay, so as, as a Christian church, Gospel of Grace, we have a Christian worldview. That means everything we see, and we have a very interesting conversation at a little birthday party we had on Friday night with uh, some people very strong of opposing viewpoints. Which is good. I always like to know, I like to know exactly the opposite of one thing so that I can balance it out, weigh it by what I know, and make my own decision. That's how I live my life politically, especially. But when you have people that are from opposite ends of things, you're not always going to agree, but you should know each other's viewpoints and circumstances. But the law would be a system of living. So as a Christian church, we have a Christian outlook. So we believe the word of God, the way the Bible teaches, this is how we live our life. We see the things going on in the world. Though that, that's because things are lining up according to what the Bible says is going to happen. That's the way we see things. So the law would be a system of living through a series of commands. Because the law, of course, you have the Ten Commandments. But then you have all the laws that were added on, right? 800 some. I don't know. I don't know. I've been redeemed from all of them. How many? Over 600. So we've been redeemed from all 600. <laughs> but it's through a series of commands. So you can do this, you can't do this, and you have to do this. That's what the law is. You have to do all those things, and you can't do these things. And through doing all that or accomplishing all that and doing all those things, that will produce righteous living. So you'll, you'll be righteous toward God. And you think, well, that's pretty good. But it's not the point of the law. And that's where I love the New Testament teaching, especially Paul's teaching. And in the book of Hebrews, that's what it's been my meditation and my daily reading. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I know we talk about simplicity of gospel and law, so I kind of got away from that. But it's going to be a Bible study today. And we're going to talk about Hebrews, the seventh chapter. And that, that's going to be the main thing of this entire thing. And I'm going to go through something real quick before we do that. I'm going to go through it kind of verse by verse. And we're going to read the whole thing. But I can read quick, so no, no big deal. Um, if you could put up Hebrews 7, the first chapter first, and then jump over to Genesis. Because that kind of set up what we're going to talk about. 
So for this Melchizedek, he's the king of Salem. He priests to the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. All right. Put verse 2 up, too. Let's do that, too. Okay. Did you already have it up there? Ah, love it. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first by interpretation, he's talking about Melchizedek here, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So for Christian people, right away, we know what he's talking about. He's talking about actually a picture of Jesus Christ in Melchizedek. He is the prince of peace, right? So you can go back to two. You're not going to jump ahead of me now. I got this now. Verse two says, king of Salem, king of peace. We know that Jesus Christ is king of peace. So he's talking about a picture of Jesus Christ, Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. Now, if you can jump back to Genesis now, and I'm going to read the New Living Translation because it reads a little bit clearer and quicker. This is the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, and it says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family. Go to the land I'll show you, and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you'll be a blessing to others. I'll bless those that bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So that's the first call of Abraham. And that's a lot of times this is kind of a picture of where we are. He's in a place in, like, say, a worldly situation. And God calls him and says, leave this. Come follow me. I'll show you where to go, but it's only step by step. He didn't show him where he's going to go at the end. And how many people know that in our lives as Christian people? We've got to walk along. It's one step at a time, one day at a time, right? One day at a time, sweet Jesus. Oh, you guys knew God sing today, right? That's all I'm asking you. Okay, forget it. Forget it, you guys don't know it. You, didn't, you should have sang along. We could have sang the whole thing. Right? But the part that I really like there is that when God shows up and talks to Abram, his blessing, he says, I will, I will, I will, I will. So right there, he's giving him a glimpse of grace right there. He's not saying, yeah, I'll do this if you do that. Right? It, it didn't come across like that. He says, I'm going to do this. So this is like the first thing. He, he calls Abram. And Abram goes out expecting because God said he'd do what he said he'd do. So he's like, all right, I can, I can handle it. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this thing. There was such a blessing on Abraham as he went out that Lot went with him, his nephew. Now, Lot and him, because of the blessing that was on Abraham, Lot was blessed through Abraham. These guys got to be so blessed. And back then, the blessing wasn't just your 401k right? Your portfolio, it was like your sheep, your cattle, your herds, right? The people you had around you, that was what the blessing was. These guys got so big that no matter where they went, there was so much people and sheep and goat herders fighting and because they were so big. So you know the story, right? Abram says to Lot, look, you can look out before you. Let's just look around right here. If you want to go that way, I'll go this way. Right? You want to go this way, I'll go that way. Whatever, Let, let's separate so we don't have this contention between us. So they do, right? Lot looks around and he sees the blessing of this valley in the, the Sodom and Gomorrah area where it's beautiful. Okay? So he's going to go to this beautiful place. I want to go there. That's, it's got everything I need for my herds. It's got good nightlife, entertainment. <laughs> Just joking, but probably did, right? Because that... That's really, it was like a beautiful place. And he's like, I'm going to take, take the good part. So Abraham goes the other way. But I just love, like, God shows up to him. And in Genesis 13, he says, after Lot left, after Lot had gone, the Lord says to Abram, look as far as you can see. Now listen, in every direction. So Abraham, he's willing to say, all right, I'll go wherever you don't want to go. I'll go the opposite way. But then God says, look in every direction. And you get all of it. So he says, as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west, I'm giving you all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. I'll give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they can't be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction for I'm giving it to you. That's some power right there. I mean, if you can go with that same blessing Abram had, think about it. He says, Go in any direction, walk through the land, and know that I'm giving it to you. 
And that's how we walk as Christian people. We walk out knowing that God's given us the land. He's given us every step we take in the situations we're in. He's already gone before and prepared the way. He's already given us that land. So it's the same blessing Abraham has. But this is what I want to show you. So when Lot went toward uh, Sodom in an area, right? And we all know what, what happens there and all eventually. But Sodom was this beautiful thing. Well, there was this war of kings. And there's too many long names for me to go through it all and get it straight for you. But basically, there's four kings and five kings are fighting. And Sodom comes out on the losing end. And, of course, all of us as Christian people, we know that Sodom was considered to be one of like the, the worst places morality-wise. Morally, moral, morali, morality wise. Did that come out all right? You know what I'm saying? Right? So as they're fleeing... They're fleeing, and they go through this place where these, there's these tar pits, and a lot of the, the people that were fleeing, the warriors that are fleeing and their army, they actually get stuck in these tar pits. But isn't that funny? Because that's what I, I try to even talk to my, my kids this way and tell them, like, you know, you see a road that you're going down, and it seems good, and it seems like a fun thing to do, but if it's not of God, if it's not in God, you always end up in the slime pit. You end up in the tar pit. So, like, it seems great, and you feel like, yeah, this is good, and I'm going along, everything's great, and I'm kind of doing what I like to do and having fun. But if it's not a God, Satan always wants to come along and just, like, hit you up. I'm going to send you into the slime pit, into the tar pit. And that's where these people ended up, in a tar pit. Some of them did. So he gets through the whole thing. So then a servant, or one of the people from Lot, actually get away, and they go to Abraham and tell him what happens. So Abraham goes after him. Abraham takes his 318 servants, and he actually has some other people there that he's allied with in the area that he lived in, the plain of Mamre. And they go after the king. This, now, this king that they went after, listen, this is the king that just won the battle against the four or five kings. Now, look, I'm not going to try and get it straight because that's besides the point. But this guy, is, he's the conquering king who just beat up all these other kings and took everything. Right? He just conquered the cities and all this. Now, Abraham's going after this king basically by himself. You know, with a couple of allies, but he's going after a king that just won. That, that's a steep thing to ask. Say, I'm going to go after this king that just won these battles. And he goes after him, surprises him at night, and completely wipes out his host, sends him fleeing. And then he goes after him and actually chases after him. And after he basically recovers all, all that was lost from, from Sodom and recovers Lot and all Lot's possessions... And he comes back, and that's where Melchizedek shows up. And we'll pick it up in the 18th verse. This is Genesis 14. In the 18th verse, it says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and, and priest of the Most High God, brought Abram some bread and wine. And I know there's lots of revelation in that, but he basically has communion with him. So he has communion with him, and Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing, saying, Blessed be Abram by the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth, Blessed be God most high, who has, defe who has defeated your enemies for you. Amen. That's awesome, because God did it for him. But it says, Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all his goods he had recovered. So that's a tithing thing right there. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in Hebrews. That's why I wanted to just set this up just a little bit with this. But the king of Sodom says to Abram, he says, Give back my people who were captured, but you can keep for yourself all the goods you recover. So basically, all I want is my people back. All the possessions that my people own that were taken by this other king, you can keep all that stuff. I just want the people back. And I like how everyone turns around and he says, Replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I won't take from you so much as a single thread or a sandal thong that belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say, I made Abram rich. This guy, is, he's awesome. I mean, he's like, I'm so confident in what God has for me. I'm so confident that I don't even want to take a thread. That's why I wanted to read that New Living. A thread. Or the King James would say like a shoe latchet. Well, like a, a sandal thong. That's it. I don't even want to take any of that from you. Because God gets all the glory in this situation. God gets it all. But Abraham knows that he is going to be made rich, but only by God. Not by this other guy. He said, I don't want you to get any of the glory. He says, I only accept for you what my young warriors have already eaten. And that if you want to, if my other guys that went with me, if they want some, they can take whatever they want. But I will not be made rich by Sodom. Because it ends up, 
Like I said before, when Sodom had to flee, they ended up in a tar pit. <laughs> Abraham's like, I ain't going there. I already got God as my blessing. All right, so let's go over to Hebrews. That's why I want to set that up so you know kind of where we're coming from in Hebrews. So we already read the first two where it says Melchizedek, king of Salem. We already got that. All right, we'll read through verse 2. So let's read verse 3 there. He's talking about Melchizedek, and he says, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but is made like unto the Son of God, and he abides a priest continually. And it's very important that it says that we're continually there. And like I said it earlier there, this is a picture of Jesus Christ. It goes on to say there, like unto the Son of God. So remember, this is Jesus Christ he's talking about. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Now, he is reading, this is the book of Hebrews, right? He's writing to the Jewish people. There's a few people in Jewish history that everybody really looks up to, right? Abraham, right? Moses, right? They might talk about Noah. They might talk about David. They might talk about these people, right? There's like really strong characters within the Hebrew nation. Abraham, though, I mean, if he's not one or two, I'm not talking about God, but I'm talking about just people that they would relate to. Because remember, all these things were passed on as stories, so people would hear the stories about what happened. So Abraham is set up on the pinnacle here. And that's why he says here, even Abraham paid tithes to this guy. He says, Verily they are they that are sons of Levi, who received an office of priesthood, and they have a commandment to take tithes from the people according to the law, and of their brethren, uh, even though they came out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from these received tithes from Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Now, I know that's a lot of words, and I read it in King James. I don't know, because I like the sound of it, I guess. <laughs> it's really deep revelation there, right? But he's talking about, here, consider how great this man was, right? How great Jesus Christ is, that even Abraham pays tithes to him. And then it says, the sons of Levi, they received the office of the priesthood. They received it just by birth. And they have a commandment to take tithes of the Jewish people. Okay? Even though the sons of Levi actually came out of Abraham. Now, it says, now, but he, this is talking about Jesus in the, in the sixth verse, whose descent is not counted from them, not counted from the Le- Levitical priesthood, he received tithes from Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Now, I think it's neat there because it says that had the promises. He's already talking about Abraham knew that he was blessed. When it says, he that had the promises, Abraham already had the promises of God. So he blessed him, and he knew that he was blessed. He already had the promise of God. But verse 7 here is really key, and this should be a key for all of us as Christian people when we talk about being free-handed and being able to give to people. And that's not just money, but our time and being able to love on people and take care of people that need help, all those sorts of things. But it says, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And if you put a new living translation up there, Tara, you have that? The new living says, without question, the person that has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. That, that's something really powerful. Now, it's not to say that if you receive something that you can, should consider the other person better. What it's saying is that it's always better to be able to give to somebody than to be in need and need something. That's all. And all of us can be in both situations. I actually love both situations. I love to be able to give to somebody. And if somebody really wants to give to me, I just say thank you and just receive it. Because I know that in giving to me, that person can be blessed too. So I don't mind going either way with it. But that's the way as Christian people, we should not be... In a situation where we always feel like I have to always give and I can never take anything that anybody else wants to give to me. Because you can actually be taking away a blessing that person actually can receive from God for giving to you. So it's good stuff. So now verse 8 says, And here men that die receive tithes. You're talking about the Levitical priesthood. So these are natural men. They're eventually going to die. They receive tithes. But there he receives him, who is witness that he lives forever. So you're talking about the, this is a a contradiction between the Levitical priesthood and Jesus' priesthood. That's what this whole chapter is about. So I always want to see the, con- the contradiction here between them. So the Levitical priesthood receives tithes, the priest will die. Jesus receives tithes, but he lives forever. So it actually says it's witness that he liveth. But I put after that on forever because he lives on forever. You have to think about it that way because sometimes in our minds like he lives, but 
he lives, but he liveth might mean man, he might die at some point. So that's why I like to put it in that he lives on forever, so he will not die. So I say, Levi also, he received tithe. He also paid tithe to Abraham because he was actually, he was in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So what he's talking about there is the Levitical priesthood and actually paid tithe to Jesus through Abraham. So he's saying this is how great this priesthood is. And this is show the greatness between the law, the Levitical priesthood, and the greatness of having the priest Jesus Christ that's interceding for us. All right, uh, verse 11 says, Therefore, if perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. Okay, so Levitical priesthood, they received the law through the Levitical priesthood. There was no, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So he's like, if, if he could have been perfect under the Levitical priesthood, under keeping the law, remember, under keeping a system, right, a system of things that's going to make you righteous. If you could be made perfect under that, why was there salt another priesthood? That's what it's saying here. If you could have been made perfect by the law through the Levitical priesthood, why is there another priesthood sought out at all? And it says, I, put, I wrote in here, this is one of the key verses of this whole thing. It says, for the priesthood being changed, there also there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So now we are not under the law to say that we have to do these things in order to be righteous, in order to have blessing, all these things. We simply receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ, who is the Melchizedek priesthood here. It says, For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe, which no man gave attendance to the altar. So he's saying Jesus came out of the tribe of Judah. That's basically what that says, and not from the, the tribe of Levi. It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, a tribe which Moses spake nothing of concerning the law. But yet it is far more evident for the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest. So it's saying there's going to arise another priest, not from the Levitical priesthood, but out of the tribe of Judah and after the order of Melchizedek. So it's, it's just a setup for it. It says, who is made not after the carnal commandments and not after the same flesh and blood as the Levitical priesthood, but of the power of endless life. And that's really key because... As a priest, a priest would go daily into the temple, right? He would, first he would sacrifice for himself, and then he would sacrifice for the sins of the people, and all these things. And people would constantly be bringing sacrifices in order to be accepted of God. So it's very important to see Jesus as your high priest. And uh, <clears throat> verse 17 says, For he testifies, you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that is Psalms 110, verse 4. David actually prophesied that line. It says, for verily there's a disannulling of the commandment going before in the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So he's talking about the law, the, the Levitical priesthood. It's weak and it's unprofitable. That, that's what the writer of Hebrews says. So people that are seeking to be justified by the law, it's saying it's weak and it's unprofitable. It's not going to profit you anything by keeping the law. New Living Translation there says, Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. The law never made anything perfect. But now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it is not also without an oath, he was made a priest. Now this is a separate part. I shouldn't jump into that because this is a separate part here that you need to read this as one part. Verse 20 and then on here it says, uh, in 21, now the priests that were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and won't repent, you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So much Jesus was made a surety of a better testament. Look, in order to be a priest, to be a Levite, all you had to do was be born a Levite. That's what it's saying. So you're, just, you're born there, that's who you are. But it's saying here that Jesus was created a high priest for us after a direct oath from God. God says, you are a priest forever. So he actually was raised up after God raising him up. God says, you will be this. But verse 22 says, uh, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. He actually says a guarantee. That's what a surety means there. Jesus was made a guarantee of a better testament. And not under the law now, there's a better testament. 
They were truly many priests, but they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So the priests, they go on and on. The priests would grow up. They go all the way through their life. They die. That's the end of that priest. Another one goes up. It keeps going and going. So it's the same thing, the repetition of the law, the continual daily sacrifice. It shows the same picture there as the, the priests going through their life as a priest and then dying. But it says, but this man, because he continues forever, he has an unchanging priesthood. So once you have... The, the priesthood of the Levitical priesthood and the law, there's a certain point, and that's what the book of Hebrews talks about, especially later on when it talks about the New Testament versus Old Testament. You have to know where the dividing line is between Old Testament and New Testament teaching. And it talks about not until the death of the testator, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the separation is. Not while Jesus was here on earth, but until he dies. That's the separation. But that's what this whole thing's talking about. It's the separation of the difference between them. But it says he has an unchanging priesthood. And if you go, it's the law of grace of Jesus Christ that continues on forever. Now, 25 says, uh, Therefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing that he ever lives forever, to, or lives forever to make intercession for him. So this is just a great thing to say. Like the law, you could do all these things, and the end of it, there's death. The Levitical priesthood, they all die. But now it's saying he saved them to the uttermost, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for us. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He doesn't need daily, as the other priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for the people's, as he once did. He offered up himself. It says, when he offered up himself. <clears throat> for the law maketh men high priests, which have an infirmity. In other words, they are going to die. There's going to come a place in time where that person will die. But the word of an oath, which is since the law, making a son who is consecrated forevermore. Now, I know there's a lot of words there. But it's basically saying the difference between the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Jesus Christ is that the priesthood of the Levites, it, it could sacrifice and you could be... Uh, you could be better right then when that happens. That's under the law. You have this bit where you're, 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 you're clean, you're free, all these things. But it always is a passing away. Every day it has to go back over the same things over and over again. Every day. And then a new high priest will come along and every day. And then Jesus comes along as a high priest that abides forever. And through one sacrifice of himself, he satisfies the law moving forward completely. And then you're going to get into Hebrews as you go on in Hebrews, talking about, like I said, the death of the testator. That's what this is all a setup for here. So it's showing a changing of the priesthood from the unprofitableness and weakness of the law to the righteousness that's only found in Jesus Christ. Now, if you read New Living Translation at verse 28, it says, The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath, and his son has been made our perfect high priest forever. So we're not going to go back under the law. That's what I always want to show through something like this is going back under the law is going back under the Levitical priesthood. We are not under the Levitical priesthood anymore. If you're trying to reach God or trying to be righteous by the works of the law, you're under the Levitical priesthood. And that's what the book of Hebrews is talking about here. It's talking about there's a change. There's a new priesthood. There's a death of a testator. There's a New Testament. And the New Testament is grace by Jesus Christ. It's not the law. There's a separation. But that's what the book of Hebrews is talking about. So when we talk about a simple gospel, um, I, I put up there as like a, a title because for some reason I always have to have a title. And I don't like making titles. But I put up there the law had to yield. The law had no choice. It was like once Jesus Christ shows up, the law has to yield to that. It was absolute perfection. And Jesus Christ moves on as our perfect high priest. But he is made the perfect high priest for you. We're no longer under the law. You're under the grace of Jesus Christ. And he abides forever. That's, I just love. See, they don't know quite who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some people say it might be Paul and all this. I think... One of the interesting things in there is I think Paul was very good at when he would put a point out there that he would always come back around and teach you something and answer his point when he was talking through it. So I can kind of see that through here that there is sort of that thing of, of very, very diligently going through and explaining what he's talking about. But through the, all this stuff that I read there, I know I read a lot of scriptures through, through uh, the, chapter, the seventh chapter there, but you have to see it as a whole picture of what he's telling you there. 
And it's just so awesome to think that you have this one thing and then it's completely done away with it, but this other one goes on forever. And I love seeing things where Jesus Christ is brought to the forefront and where Jesus says, I'm a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, after the order of the Prince of Salem, the Prince of Peace. That's what our new, our new translation is, our New Testament is. It's after Jesus Christ. So I want you to relax and know that you're not under the law anymore. You're not under the Levitical priesthood anymore. As Christian people, we're, we're not. We're under now the law of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what it's talking about here in the seventh chapter. No longer under the law, you're now under grace. So don't just read the scripture to see Jesus. Read it to see Jesus and his finished work. It's more than enough. Amen? So God, just thank you. We so share some time here and uh, just learn a little bit more, God, and just try to get our brains around us because I think we constantly need to be uh, having our, our minds renewed all the time because it always seems like something else comes up where you want to go back and just do things that are under the law. But constantly being reminded that Jesus Christ completely fulfilled the law and that we are now under a new testament of grace, it's just so refreshing, Lord. It brings a, a state of being relaxed being at ease, uh, not stressed. All, all those things come from knowing that we are safe and secure in our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't think there's any way around it. I think that people that can't see Jesus and his finished work, there's never peace. But now we are under a high priest that says he is the king of Salem, king of peace. That's who we're under. And God, I just thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, that we can trust you in all things. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. God, I pray that just like Abraham here, where God says, I will bless you. I will do these things. I pray that everybody that hears us would know that we are blessed. We are blessed. The same blessings Abraham has are also, we're also to receive that same blessing through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had the ability to bless Abraham. And that's the priest that we're under. So we receive that blessing from our high priest, Jesus Christ. God, I just thank you for your grace and mercy. We love you, Lord. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we say amen. Amen. Let's get up on our feet. Let's sing no longer slaves.